ผมว่าจริงนะครับพอเราอยู่มานานเราเรารู้สึกว่าชินพอพอเราชินแล้วเราก็รู้สึกว่ามันมันมันมีความสุขก็พอโอเคนะมันก็ก็พออยู่ได้อ่ะพี่ว่าดีครับได้ฝึกทักษะได้ออกกําลังอย่าคิดให้เป็นปัญหาคิดให้มันเป็นแรงบันดาลใจมันดีกว่าครับทนไหวไม่ใช่ทางออกประสบการณ์การเดินทางเท้าที่แย่เป็นสิ่งที่เราชาวกรุงเทพต้องเจอทุกวันและกำลังเป็นประเด็นปัญหาที่ถูกกล่าวถึงมากขึ้นอิดเสื่อมสภาพสายไฟรกรุงรังแสงสว่างที่ไม่เพียงพอในยามค่ำคืนทางม้าลายที่ไม่ปลอดภัยและรถมอเตอร์ไซค์ที่ขึ้นมาวิ่งบนฟุตบาทเป็นประจำจากการสำรวจคนกรุงเทพมีความเครียดเรื่องสิ่งแวดล้อมในเมืองถึง 37.84% และปัจจัยที่ทำให้กรุงเทพไม่น่าอยู่ก็คือเรื่องของสภาพแวดล้อมถึง 61.31% แต่วันนี้ปัญหาเหล่านี้กำลังจะถูกแก้ไขเพราะตอนนี้ทุกฝ่ายทั้งนักวิจัยนักออกแบบและหน่วยงานภาครัฐกำลังหันมาร่วมมือกันเพื่อเก็บข้อมูลปัญหาต่างๆเกี่ยวกับทางเท้าช่วยกันแชร์ไอเดียออกแบบทางเดินที่ทุกคนอยากได้เพิ่มความปลอดภัยในการข้ามถนนมีกิจกรรมส่งเสริมการเดินจัดการระบบนำทางให้สะดวกมากขึ้นเพิ่มสภาพแวดล้อมที่ปลอดภัยในการเดินจัดการพื้นที่และภูมิทัศน์บนทางเท้าให้หน้าเดินสำหรับทุกคนใช่ครับมันกำลังจะเกิดขึ้นจริงโดยเริ่มต้นจากย่านเจริญกรุงเป็นที่แรกสตรีสเคปแบงคอกคุณสามารถร่วมกันแชร์ความคิดเห็นว่าทางเท้าแบบไหนที่คุณอยากได้ผ่านเกม Street Fighter ทางเว็บไซต์ด้านล่างแคปชั่นนี้เลยครับแบงคอกดีไซน์วีคจากความสำเร็จของแบงคอกดีไซน์วีค2018ระยะเวลาตลอด9วันที่มีผู้เข้าชมงานทั้งชาวไทยและชาวต่างชาติมากกว่า 400,000 คนได้มาร่วมค้นพบประสบการณ์แห่งการสร้างสรรค์จากกิจกรรมกว่า500รายการที่เกิดขึ้นในพื้นที่ต่างๆทั่วกรุงเทพกว่า60สถานที่กรุงเทพมหานครเมืองหลวงที่เต็มเปี่ยมไปด้วยแรงดึงดูดที่ชวนให้ผู้คนทั่วโลกเดินทางมาสัมผัสประสบการณ์ที่หลากหลายมากด้วยมิติแห่งความคิดสร้างสรรค์และเรื่องราวชวนจดจำ Bangkok Design Week 2019ปรากฏการณ์ที่กำลังจะเกิดขึ้นในมหานครแห่งนี้ Fusing Forward ประสานสร้างสู่อนาคตการประสานศาสตร์ต่างสาขาที่ขับเคลื่อนด้วยความคิดสร้างสรรค์ตั้งแต่ความดั้งเดิมมากคุณค่าอย่างงานหัตถกรรมจนถึงความล้ำสมัยของดิจิตอลและเทคโนโลยีเพื่อตอบสนองทั้งธุรกิจและคุณภาพชีวิตของผู้คนยุคปัจจุบันมาพร้อมกับการรวมพลังของนักสร้างสรรค์และผู้ประกอบการธุรกิจกว่า 1,000 รายพบกับ5กิจกรรมหลัก Showcase and Exhibition การจัดแสดงผลงานและนิทรรศการที่สะท้อนศักยภาพของนักออกแบบและธุรกิจสร้างสรรค์จากกรุงเทพและเมืองต่างๆทั่วโลก Talk and Workshop กิจกรรมเพิ่มเติมความรู้และแรงบันดาลใจจากนักสร้างสรรค์ของไทยและต่างประเทศ Creative District ร่วมชมต้นแบบการส่งเสริมย่านเจริญกรุงสู่ความเป็นย่านสร้างสรรค์ทั้งด้านธุรกิจและคุณภาพชีวิต Event and Program กิจกรรมส่งเสริมนักสร้างสรรค์ในการแสดงศักยภาพในหลายรูปแบบทั้งดนตรีภาพยนตร์และศิลปะการแสดงอื่นๆร่วมถึงกิจกรรม Open House และ Creative Market ตลาดนัดสร้างสรรค์มากกว่า100ร้านค้าจากผลงานของนักสร้างสรรค์สร้างโอกาสในการขายสินค้าและการขยายเครือข่ายธุรกิจของผู้ประกอบการห้ามพลาด26มกราคมถึง3กุมภาพันธ์2562
ที่อาคารไปรสนีกลางและย่านเจริญกรุงค้นพบแรงบันดาลใจใหม่ๆและมาร่วมกันสร้างให้กรุงเทพมหานครเป็นมหานครแห่งความสร้างสรรค์พร้อมขับเคลื่อนเศรษฐกิจของประเทศและพัฒนาคุณภาพชีวิตของทุกคน Bangkok Design Week 2019จัดโดย CEA สำนักงานส่งเสริมเศรษฐกิจสร้างสรรค์องค์การมหาชนครับคุณผู้ชมทุกท่านนะครับยินดีต้อนรับเข้าสู่กิจกรรมทอล์กนะครับกิจกรรมที่อยู่ในเทศกาลงานออกแบบกรุงเทพ 2,562 นะครับซึ่งเทศกาลในปีนี้นะครับเรามีธีมที่ว่าประสานสร้างสวนอนาคตนะครับในวันนี้นะครับเราได้รับเกียรติจากผู้เชี่ยวชาญนะครับในด้านการบริหารจัดการน้ำนะครับซึ่งมาจากประเทศเนเธอร์แลนด์นะครับซึ่งประเทศเนเธอร์แลนด์เนี่ยก็เป็นเมืองที่มีน้ําเช่นเดียวกันกับกรุงเทพนะครับวันนี้นะครับเราได้รับเกียรติจากสปีกเกอร์ของเรานะครับคุณอานาลูสเนลิสันนะครับจะมาพูดให้ฟังนะครับในหัวข้อของ Designing for Water Inclusive City นะครับผมขออนุญาตเรียนเชิญคุณอนาลูสเนลิสันนะครับ She's the co-founder of de facto architecture and urbanism and she's gonna talk about the topic of designing for water inclusive city please welcome Miss Anna Luz Nelson Good afternoon. Thank you for being here on your free weekend evening. Um, today, I'll share some experiences from my practice in the Netherlands uh, on designing on water inclusive cities as an urban designer. Uh, this morning, I already got inspired by some presentations of Thai designers um, dealing with revitalization of the riverfront, and I hope to inspire you all by those examples from the Netherlands. Has any of you been in the Netherlands? Visited the Netherlands? Ah, quite some people. I will still explain the context. Oh. If I can. Ah, yes, I got it. Nope. It's more difficult than I thought. Yes. Um, this is actually a map of the Rotterdam area in the Netherlands. Um, we here see the city of Rotterdam with its harbor area, and it has a position uh, in the delta area between the sea and the river area, similar to Bangkok. Um, and what we see in delta areas is that they have very similar challenges worldwide. Um, today, I will focus on the relation between flood risk protection um, and urbanization, and how to uh, protect against floods while keeping the water in the city. Um, this is something what we see happening over the whole world. This is a map where, in dark blue, we see the frequency of flooding, and in red, we see the density of urbanization. Um, I call this the, the paradox of urban deltas um, because we see that most urbanization is in the area where there's most frequent flooding. Uh, of course, because those delta areas are very good areas for settlement, uh, harbor connectivity, but with climate change and sea level rise, they're facing a huge challenge. Oh. Um, What we see here is the map of Rotterdam again, and here in yellow and green, we see a reconstruction of what the delta looked like around 1300. Uh, and light over that, we see or what I refer to as engineered delta uh, with the harbors, and we see that a lot of space of the natural riverbed or the original riverbed has been canalized over time. Uh, sometimes they make the joke that God created the world except for the Netherlands because it was created by the Dutch. We have a very strong engineering tradition um, that we're proud of, but also uh, has some downsides for integration in the spatial surroundings. Um, if we look at the Netherlands, and actually 
that big city is already in Germany. Um, this blue area is the area that is below sea level. So that is uh, quite an extensive area. And we see that our two main cities, uh, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and our third city, The Hague, are all in this uh, area below sea level. So it's not a surprise that we needed to deal with this flood risk. This happened um, during uh, yeah, a lot of centuries that they slowly started building a system uh, of levees and polders to reclaim the land and be able to keep living there. Um, we had a big flood in 1950, just after the war, or maintenance was not up to order. Um, this flood caused a lot of fatalities. And after that, the Dutch engineers came up with a plan uh, to really close off the delta area with a lot of big dams and barriers. Uh, of course, from a flood risk perspective, this is a very good approach. Um, but what they, for instance, were not aware of, because they looked at it quite integrally, also at spatial aspects, um, they saw those uh, dams as a potential connection to a rural area. They uh, expected the economy to grow there to create a recreational area for the expanding city. Um, but, for instance, ecology was not really in the picture yet. So they didn't realize that locking off those sea arms would actually impact ecology. They were more thinking uh, of the fresh water, because this is, of course, salty water. It would create for agriculture, because they were very much thinking about food security at that time. Uh, and since then, time changed a bit, and uh, yeah, more aspects became important. This is our current delta, um, and we're still working on a flood risk strategy. A lot of people are asking why, isn't it safe there? Uh, actually, it's very safe. Um, but what is special about the Netherlands is that they work on a proactive strategy. Most flood risk strategies are made after uh, a major flood or disaster. Uh, and the Dutch government, after witnessing the floods in uh, New Orleans, uh, New York, Japan said, we need to be proactive and see how we can face climate change and remain an attractive place to live and work. Um, with this current program that has a um, kind of future uh, outlook to 2100, we see that a lot of new elements are introduced. Um, we see also ecology, uh, spatial quality, quality of the urban space, cultural heritage, um, soil subsidence, and energy transition. Um, this energy transition means that we're moving from um, carbonized energy to electric energy, uh, which will take a lot of space if you look at it spatially. If we look at our system, and I think this is um, one of the important aspects for designers to understand if they're working with flood risk, um, designers and landscape architects, urban designers, are very much about connecting different skill levels. They're trained to think from the local skill uh, to the urban skill to the regional skill. And we see that that flood risk system works on different skills as well. Um, this is one of our famous barriers. It's normally open. It can close in case of high water. And it closes when the water is just a few centimeters higher than it is there on the photo in the city of Rotterdam. So it protects the city from flooding. Um, with the new sea level rise scenarios, they were calculating that in the future, uh, this barrier that now only closes about once every 10 years would have to close 27 times a year, which is a lot, especially since our main harbor is behind it. Uh, so that would cause economic loss. As an alternative, I'm not suggesting to remove it completely. Engineers are sometimes scared if they see this red cross through their um, structure. But as an alternative, you can also take local interventions. Um, for instance, by designing a levee, and in this part, the levee is designed as a parkway, a local park uh, for the residents. And actually, um, people living there like this prospect a lot. Uh, the municipality was scared they wouldn't. Uh, want this intervention, but actually it could give an impulse to the quality of the space. Another option is to flood-proof houses on a smaller scale. Uh, this is a house in Dordrecht. Um, 
we see this guy who is just about to close his curtain because he's getting tired of all the photographers. Um, but that is another option. It's quite costly, but you can treat a house to a way that it uh, is completely flood proof. Um, the Netherlands has a very strong tradition of probability reduction, so that means that they keep the water out, protect uh, against high water levels, um, but that is not taking care of the rainwater. And we have more and more issues with heavy rainstorms um, and the water not being able to go out because there are also high water levels um, outside the levee. Um, and here we see a plan that was made for an area in Zeewolde, um, where a lot of water storage capacity is introduced into the living area. Uh, so it's actually turned around, where normally the back garden would be, um, now there's water. And uh, in here, a lot of different um, ecotopes could be created by doing so. Ah, yeah. um, this is actually an example in Germany, uh, or eastern neighbor country. Um, and what they did there is that they didn't put the barrier between the river and the city at the edge of the city, um, but they let the water come in a bit. So this area we see here is still in the floodplain, um, but it's not flooding that frequently, so most of the year you can use it. And actually, if it floods, it became quite a spectacle. So people want to see it flooding, um, and this is the dry level. So up here you're safe and dry, and most of the buildings have flood-proof doors that can be closed. And it floods so frequently here that they could really make an experience out of it. And you see that some buildings even have double entrances. They have the normal uh, water level entrance and the high water level entrance. Um, and this way it becomes very possible to um, make the river go into part of the city uh, at some occasions without having any damage. The public space is designed in a way that it slopes a little bit so the water goes out automatically and after the first rainstorm everything is kind of clean again. Um, this is where the Dutch history of flood risk uh, protection started uh, with houses that were put on mounds, little hills. This was actually quite effective, um, but when the properties of people grew, this works very well if you have two goats and a cow, but if you have two cars, uh, three kids, and 150 cows a person, you cannot drag all your belongings onto the mount anymore. Um, so the necessity came to build the dikes. Um, Another flood-proof housing typology we have. So those are all options, like if you let the water come into certain areas. Uh, those are floating houses. Those are pole houses, so I saw many of them here, so that is uh, nothing new. Actually, in the Netherlands, they're quite exotic. And this is an interesting housing type. Those are the amphibious houses. Uh, those are houses that, during normal situations, are standing on this concrete base, um, but if the water goes up, and it can go up to kind of five meters here, um, the house can float up. They're connected to those mooring poles uh, that make sure that you don't wake up in Paris uh, after the flood. Um, so you stay in place, and uh, it floats automatically. With the first project, they didn't make the pole higher than the levee, so the houses could float off. It almost happened with the first project, because what we know as Dutch is water is never as predictable as you think. So we calculate how high it will come, and the first year it comes higher. Um, so those poles are higher than the levee, so they can never go off. So altogether in the Netherlands we have this system with on the regional scale uh, large barriers, even rivers that are being redirected. On the regional smaller scale we have dike rings and pumping stations to get out the rainwater. At the local scale, we have completely elevated areas or small fences. And on the building scale, we have flood-proof houses. Um, in the Netherlands, it's very much still focused on this um, yeah, kind of protection against flood. But we see more and more uh, people saying we should also take care of this, what they refer to second layer, uh, making sure that if there is a flood, 
there's less damage. Because if there's a flood in the Netherlands, um, the damage and the amount of fatalities can be huge. Um, here we see the same area again. Um, and we see that especially in the peat polders that are slowly subsiding, because they are getting lower and lower, uh, the flood can sometimes be five meters high and come very quickly and unexpected. And in the Netherlands, um, we see that now there's kind of this uh, new momentum in flood risk management. Here we see the river near Nijmegen. Um, and this is the original trained river. And what they found out is that actually, with increasing rainfall, they trained the river too much. Um, they didn't expect those increase in flows, of course. They didn't know about climate change when they established this. Um, but after a while, they said, we cannot keep um, elevating and elevating the levees. Um, and they made a bypass here. This is called Room for the River. And they made sure that the river got more space. So it's basically restoring the natural system a bit. Um, luckily, they were able to do it. They had to outplace some people, but they had a very good stakeholder involvement uh, process. So everyone went uh, willingly. Um, because they were all happy with the extra quality in the neighborhood and they could choose a, a new position for their house in this area that all of a sudden was much more valuable because of the extra waterfront. Uh, this was very inspiring also. I'm a teacher at the Delft University uh, for our students and uh, we did a lot of studies trying to see where could you replicate this. And here you see that um, we have the old levees that are um, kind of washed on with sedimentation. And then later there are new levees made. Um, and there are now a lot of people wondering whether we should have those in-between zones again as tidal areas with a lot of space for ecology. This is one of the designs of such an area um, where the original levee is breached. The secondary levee is enforced, uh, and this huge intertidal zone, which is now agriculture land, um, can be created that both functions as a living environment as well as for ecology. Then the architecture students of this studio were also thinking about this thematic, um, because of course with the tidal movement of the river, uh, which can be quite strong, um, you need to keep some distance from the water, though everyone wants to be as close to the water as possible. Um, so this is a design. In the Netherlands, the floods are often in winter, um, where students designed the outdoor space downstairs, very close to the river in summer. Uh, during the winter, the water will go up, but you don't need the space anyway, so it's a very uh, smart way of multifunctional use. This is another project from the student studio who looked at the Thames River. Um, I took this because I thought it was inspiring for Bangkok. Um, because what he said is actually it's not possible to put the levee um, at the bank between the river and uh, the old docks. So he proposed to also put back the levee and create this area that can flood during high water uh, and becomes this kind of natural park uh, within it, a lot of flood-proof buildings. If we look at the Netherlands, we see that those levees are quite dominant. Um, and here we see a map of the levees that would need to be elevated um, with the new projected climate change. And we see again that is especially in the polar areas. This is how some of those areas already look. And they asked us as designers um, how spatially they could elevate this with two meters more. Um, I don't know if they're designers, but try to imagine how to make this two meters higher again. Um, we here see the historical buildings on both sides. Um, so those dike elevations are becoming quite, um, quite a challenge, let's put it that way. Not having a good connection with this pointer. Um, 
What we try to do is that since the waterfront was already privatized and a lot of people uh, were feeling that it was a pity to not be able to access the river, um, and there was no way to save the houses with the um, levee being elevated at its current location. Um, here we designed a cover dam on the outside of the river that would create a footpath where people could get very close to the river, um, which would improve the safety because there was no safe walking path on the village street. Um, and of course, those people have a bit of a wall in their garden, which is not ideal, uh, but compared to having to demolish your house and uh, reconstruct it, it was deemed to be quite a good alternative. Oh. Um, another thing that now is being worked on is actually inspired of the mangrove forest in uh, Asia, uh, and it is the called Building with Nature. Um, because if there are willows or mangrove forest, uh, the wave energy from the water reduces. Um, so if you plant them in front of a levee, uh, sometimes the levee does not need to be elevated. And at the same time, uh, it creates those incredible opportunities to make parks or landscapes. So that was taken into the flood risk strategy next to the uh, already available strategy of having the levees, as well was the room for the river uh, strategy, uh, where new inner dike uh, bypasses are created. To show it is an example of the De Hague city center, um, here we see the beachfront, and here we see the historic Coor House, and the levee in this case is here. And here the question was, how can we elevate this levee with 12 meters? Um, also, that is quite challenging, I can tell you. Um, so the municipality uh, was a bit worried, like, what are we going to do with this 12 meter elevation? So we did a research uh, that is not meant as a realistic design, but was meant to show the municipality um, what kind of options they would have when they would select either a hard seaward extension uh, or a soft seaward extension. Um, while doing that, we also did a lot of analysis of how people move through the area. So here, a lot of people got a GPS tracker, so we could follow them through the area. Um, we handed out those trackers at a parking garage, and unfortunately, a lot of them turned out to go into the theater uh, and go out again. That is where we see that big black dot. Um, but it was very interesting to be able to monitor um, where people perceive uh, barriers or how they know the tissue works and how to get to the coast. Um, one of the things that was very interesting of that was the interaction with the engineers. Um, they would give us guiding technical principles, for instance, the perpendicular dam. They would tell us uh, it had a certain length where it gives automatic sedimentation and certain lengths where it gives erosion. And we would then try to fit it at different locations to see where it would fit best from an urban perspective. So there was really this kind of dual assessment, both from a technical and from a spatial perspective. Um, the Netherlands is very famous for designing with flood risk. But what I think is very important is to not copy uh, the solutions, but to copy the thoughts and the methodology. Um, because levees are not the best solution everywhere. Um, and we see that this Dutch flood risk um, knowledge is often being exported. Uh, this is Houston that recently suffered a major flood. Um, actually, there was already work being done there before that, after Hurricane Ike. Um, and what we see here is that uh, water has a very important ecological function. It has everywhere, but here there is large biodiversity, uh, very close to the industrial area. Um, this is a photo taken after Hurricane Ike. Actually, this whole strip used to be built. And uh, when you went there one or two years after the hurricane, everything was rebuilt again. So there is a completely different perception of risk. Uh, people ensure it. Those are all holiday house. When the uh, warning comes uh, for the flood, people leave and they come back later and they rebuild their house uh, again and again. Uh, so completely different perception. It's a very big shipping channel, Joe. 
Um, and that is, of course, quite tricky. The hurricane almost hit it um, with Hurricane Ike. Uh, it only missed this area, I think, on one kilometer, so that could have been a huge uh, catastrophe. And also here, from the technical point of view, um, they proposed very different interventions that could be taken on different places. Uh, and as designers, we started investigating what would that mean. Like we saw in the Netherlands, uh, a certain choice for a certain location can have a huge impact on the urban composition, the development. Um, so here they asked us to have a look what would be possible. And we mainly looked at this peninsula, um, which is Galveston. Houston actually used to be here, but after a big flood, it moved uh, up bay. This was, I think, one of the most prosperous areas of that time. Um, and what we did is, together with engineers, explore a lot of different possibilities, um, what a flood risk body could look like. Um, if you do it just from the cost benefit, you very often get uh, a concrete wall or a concrete slab along the river. Um, because the assessment criteria, uh, this is very technical, but it's super essential. Uh, very often, the, the assessment criteria have cost in it, they have safety in it, uh, they have land ownership, do we get in trouble with people living there? Um, but very often, it does not have spatial quality in there. Um, so what you see is if they apply that, you get a concrete wall. Um, I heard there are some of those around here as well. Um, and by drawing those different options, you can really start the process with the community to talk about the pros and cons of different options. Then, as designers, we kind of projected what those options would have to offer. Um, they're all very different. Uh, the higher levees, the more natural levees, need to be quite high to resist the, the water. Um, they're also more hard structures that can be a bit lower. Um, and in the end, we decided to, what actually as a designer you don't prefer, um, to hide a hard structure in a dune, because the dune needed to be quite high to resist waves. Um, so eventually, an option was selected where under the current road, um, because that was the only possibility based on land ownership, um, below the road, they would construct a, a hard levee and then cover it with a sandy dune so that it would look like a more natural uh, structure. Um, another area I've been working on for quite a long time by now um, is for the Bangladesh Delta Plan. <coughs> so in the Netherlands, we had the uh, Dutch Delta Plan that looked at 2100. Uh, and Bangladesh uh, is, well, as is well known, um, facing a lot of uh, floods and also has a very high urbanization rate. Um, so for this project, we here see the Bangladesh Delta with its main capital um, of Dhaka here, and its natural area, the Sundarbans there. Um, also wanted to have a look at this future perspective for flood risk. Um, of course, also here, you cannot just bring in the Dutch examples um, because things were very different here. Um, this is an image from the Rotterdam Climate Adaptation Strategy, and this photo is meant to show how terrible our flood issues are in rainwater conditions. Um, because if this guy wants to cross without wet feet, he has to walk at least 20, 30 meters. Um, so we have some inconvenience, but it's actually not that bad. Um, oh. ah. Let's see. I'll try to get to the... No, it wants to show this picture. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, I need to go back. back further. Yeah. Um, so what we see here, I'll actually do it from behind the laptop. I'm fine standing there. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, what we see here is, of course, like a complete different uh, dimension of the issue, and also um, much higher valuables than we're used to deal with. Um, so when we worked on this project, of course, we worked together with a very big team um, of local engineers that would have all the knowledge about the issues and how they are created. Um, if we look at Bangladesh, we see that um, the capital is quite centralized. So it has a very high density. Uh, most people are living in the capital, Dhaka, um, and Chittagong is also growing quite fast and is facing with immense urban growth, as is Bangkok. And if you look at the potentials for room for the river, we see that this is the levee. Um, this is it in 2003, so we see the flood plain here. Um, we see that it regularly floods, so people are aware of the fact that it is a flood plain. Um, but if we look 10 years later, um, we see that everything has already been built, so it goes quite fast. Um, and this is not, as what is often taught, um, the slum development, uh, with people having no other option than to live here, but this is really project development in areas with a restriction uh, on building. And I think there, as designers, you really see that putting a planning restriction is not enough, because there is a restriction here. Um, so we talked with people from the planning commission and they said, well, we put a restriction, there's nothing more we can do. Then it's up to the people who uh, maintain this to make sure it's not being built. Um, but I think as a designer, you can um, predict this will happen if land is that scarce and there is a road there. Uh, so you really need additional tools to make sure the land remains free uh, or gets developed in a way you would like. Uh, of course, the setting here is completely different. Um, also, the levees are completely different. If you look at the Dutch uh, flood risk budget, 45% uh, of the budget goes to maintenance, research, updating of the existing levees. So the construction is only a small part of the cost. Um, we see two issues here. The first is that in Bangladesh they have to uh, get a lot of loans through the World Bank or the development banks, uh, and they don't have, they're changing that, but in general they don't have huge budgets for maintenance. So you can construct the levees, um, but you cannot maintain them. Um, and that could really lead to a false sense of security, because currently people are building uh, their houses on poles or on small mounds, and they're used to the flood coming in. Um, when the levees are constructed, um, very often that is not done anymore, so that second layer of safety will disappear. Um, and then if a levee breaches, it gives huge uh, floodings. Um, what you also see is that some people are making holes in the levee, uh, because during the rain season the levees also present, prevent the water from going out. Uh, so sometimes they dig a hole in the levee to make sure the water goes out, but if, of course, a few months later um, the river water is quite high, um, it will breach and flood in. Um, for this area, with the Delta Plan, two kind of uh, potential long-term strategies were developed. Um, and one was actually a full levee system, with a lot of, in red, we see the levees, uh, control of the rivers, and uh, what you do there is actually comparable to the uh, Netherlands system. We here see a density map, and though Bangladesh is very densely built, we do see that actually the coast is quite scarcely inhabited, because people know it's very risky. Um, if you put the levees, at least what happened in the Netherlands, is that people will probably um, spread to the whole country, because all areas are equally as safe, or perceived as equally safe. Um, we made a counter alternative uh, that only protects the most dense uh, cores, and in between that uh, keeps the water tradition, because the water is also needed for agriculture, uh, fertilization, and preventing subsidence. What is very important when working with those kind of long-term strategies is that actually the future uh, is unsecure. 
So that means that where planners uh, 10 or 20 years ago um, made a lot of master plans and said, okay, you can realize this and then the city can look like this for the next 100 years. Um, we now know that things are more unpredictable. Both the urban growth is unpredictable, um, the economic growth, but what we also see is that with the growth of economy, um, we see changing in values. So um, if your land is flooding frequently, of course, flood risk is your first um, kind of uh, worry. Um, also, if the water is very polluted, uh, one of the best things to do is to get it out of the city, uh, close it up, because it's unhygienous. Um, but what we see in cities that have overcome those challenges is that very often, uh, after the water is cleaned, it actually becomes a benefit to the city. Um, and in a lot of cities in the Netherlands, they're now trying to open up those original waters again. Um, also to restore the functioning of the water system. Um, we see a lot of softening of river edges. So in a lot of engineering projects, uh, the water is in concrete basins, pushed as quick as possible out of the area. Um, though that is not the best way to do it for boat ecology, um, and also the perception now is that it's better to kind of have the water go through the river slowly. Um, and we also see opening up of barriers because they have too much ecological impact. Um, so it's very important if you work on those kind of projects to already have this outlook uh, to what the city will look like in 10, 20 or maybe even 50 years um, and what kind of quality the river can offer and make sure nothing happens that kind of blocks those potentials. Um, for the Bangladesh situation, um, we here see the current canals, uh, who are basically a sewerage system. Um, so this water is very polluted, very smelly. Um, and we see in general that a lot of uh, informal urbanization and slums are uh, originating alongside it. Um, what you also see is that sometimes the canal is wide enough, uh, but then there's a bridge put in it by another sector. Um, which has a very small hole and water doesn't flow uh, more than the kind of smallest bottleneck. So actually this whole canal is then not even functioning. Um, and then the people from the cable department uh, and water department very often put cables in front of it, uh, which blocks the whole um, canal. So here we see that even the intersectoral corporation uh, between different sectors, it's very important to keep it working. Um, what we're proposing here is to do a slum upgrade project um, to resettle the people in the same neighborhood in uh, housing and create a more open waterfront, more public waterfront, also with spaces for markets, uh, already anticipating on this uh, future cleaner water. Um, another principle we're trying to apply um, is for the areas that are now uh, illegally being built, um, losing all its water, retaining capacity, all its ecological capacity, um, to have uh, public-private partnerships, uh, where part of the area is deepened a bit, uh, part of the area is elevated, so you don't have the levee that can breach, but you have an elevated uh, mount development can be on. Um, and at the same time, increasing the water storage capacity, um, also including other sustainable urbanism aspects, such as green roofs, uh, walkable cities, a lot of public space, and maintaining agriculture in the city. And this will then be the flood situation. This can very well be combined with green structures um, for a city to have green structures and green walking routes is essential, both for livability, um, to counter the urban heat effect, but also to create walking routes. Um, because mobility in Dhaka, and I think here as well, is more and more becoming an issue. Um, so it's very important for the uh, lower income groups to have uh, qualitative walking routes through the city. Identity is, of course, very important. Um, this is an area near one of the main rivers. Uh, and we saw a proposal of engineers to kind of train the rivers. So they wanted to straighten those edges, 
um, and make more of a canal out of the river to be able to control it. Um, and when you look at Google Earth, that's why I showed it in the beginning, you see this meandering, intertwining rivers. Um, so we felt that making those canals uh, would gain more land, but it would really um, yeah, not support this local identity and quality of the Bangladesh rivers. Um, so we proposed here to use the chars that are in the middle of the river and are natural uh, high areas um, to stabilize them. Of course, that is done by the engineers in the team. Uh, to stabilize them at strategic locations and then actually have the urban development in the middle instead of the edges uh, and create a very special uh, identity which fits the existing landscape. Two more small notions, and then I see the clock ticking, but I'm still luckily in time. Um, is that apart from um, changing values, of course the future in general is quite unsure. Here we see the Rotterdam Harbor, uh, and there they're now thinking a lot about what will the future harbor look like. Um, they see changes in fossil energy streams, um, like the, the black holes, um, because simply uh, more and more energy is sustainable. And they're really thinking, what will be your next economy? So with all those future plans, it's really important to look at trends and uh, kind of, you can never really predict them, but at least make sure the design uh, is adaptable to future changes. Um, and another one is that there's really this huge um, potential, and I hope the lecture already um, showed this potential, but to combine um, flood risk structures with public space. Um, this is an example of Porto Alegre, um, where this is the existing levee. Um, and you see that this levee, which is elevated, is used as a road, and it's cutting off this park and this urban tissue from the riverfront. Uh, and here it actually changes into a concrete wall uh, that follows the complete city center to protect it. Um, with this design, which is, as you can see, quite old, it's not even at the proper resolution, but I wanted to show it eagerly. Um, we made a proposal to put the flood risk structure uh, in the bay, this is not a river, so it's not uh, limiting the river flow. Um, and that way, we could really make a connection from the main roads in the city center um, over the existing barrier of the road and uh, turn the river into kind of a place for uh, people to really enjoy the river, hang out. Um, and we also made sure that there were different circles with different lengths. Uh, so that people could use it for jogging or biking and recreation. So they could choose their own um, kind of preferred cycle. That's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Nelson. Yes, and now it's Q&A time. And would you please stand with yes. me over here? Right. ครับมีคําถามเข้ามาแล้วนะครับจากทางซิปอีเวนต์นะครับ Okay let's see the question หากจะใช้ไอเดียใหม่ๆในการแก้ปัญหาเช่นบ้านลอยน้ําปล่อยให้น้ําท่วมในบางช่วงของปีคุณมีวิธีอย่างไรให้ผู้คนยอมรับ Um so how can you make people accept about the the new idea of floating house or let, let the flood stay for a little while in, in, in some, some moment of the year. Mm -hmm. so, so how can you make people accept that? I think um, one aspect of it is to show it is possible and what kind of image it would create and especially what would be the alternative. Um, because in those areas we're often not keeping the water in because it's fun to have the water. Well, it, it is to a certain degree. Um, but also because there's a necessity from a flood risk perspective. Um, and we, if we look at the alternatives between having a hard uh, concrete barrier um, or having a very public open waterfront uh, that sometimes allows some water in, um, yeah, it's easy to involve people. Yeah, so, so the water is not the bad thing. No. And you can yeah. live with it. Definitely. Just accept it. 
uh, <laughs> to a certain degree. It's, a <laughs> it's kind of a controlled acceptance. So um, I think a lot of the interventions done here are based on understanding the mechanisms, really sitting together with people who know about the hydraulics, uh, who know about the structures and uh, the urban designers uh, to come to a very integrated solution. And then indeed, uh, what we see in most projects where the water is let in, because of course in the Netherlands this is also a sensitive um, issue for a country that suffered a, a major flood with a lot of fatalities. Um, so it is often a, a discussion if this happens, uh, but in the end the, the spatial or the ecological benefits are quite severe. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next question. Are there any cases that need different solutions for different times or occasions of the year? Um, yes, actually there are. Um, there are some flexible solutions. Um, so there are some areas where putting a barrier actually was a very um, large intervention. Uh, and there they have flexible barriers that during the normal season you don't see them, but they can come up in case of a flood. They automatically start floating and they form this uh, wall to protect against the water. Yes, and, and how much is the... Um, is it expensive or...? Um, <laughs> yes, flood risk in general is very expensive. Uh, actually, there's a lot of debate in the Netherlands whenever we need to update the flood risk system. Like, what if we don't have economic growth anymore and we cannot pay for this expensive system? And what you see in general is that the levees that are made out of earth, they're quite affordable. Um, but of course, a lot of people build their houses on them because they're the safe places to live. Um, so by now, this elevation of the levee is not that cheap anymore, even if the levee is out of uh, ground, because they need to purchase the houses uh, to remove them, to replace them in order to elevate the levee. Uh, and then all of a sudden, those movable barriers uh, become a lot more affordable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And next question. What do you think of Bangkok City urban planning, designing regarding flood risk? What are the top concerns, issues that should be improved? Mm -hmm. I think that's a very valid uh, question. Have, have you been in Bangkok? <laughs> A little, yes. Okay. Uh, but of course, I'm not an expert on the situation here. So, so, so have you seen Bangkok when, when it's flooding? No, I've no. seen photos of it. Yes. Do, uh, do, do, uh, do you know the news, uh, like in um, 2010 11? or 11? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, you know of course, um, I saw the images of that. Um, and I think here, if I have... Uh, first look at the river, but again, I would have to study it to be sure, um, is what I notice is that a lot of the river is privatized. So I think uh, that is a loss as a potential of a public space. Um, in some lectures that were coming by, I saw some of the concrete levees really blocking the relation between the river uh, and the urban area. And I think um, my advice, but that is my first quick mm -hmm. advice, yeah. Um, would be to much more consider those kind of intermediate zones where maybe you can allow some flood but make sure developments are uh, flood proof. Um, to really look what kind of uh, flood frequency there is because then you can design with it. But keep that connection and also to pay uh, attention to the ecological function of the river and the social function and it as a public space. And I, I think one thing we learned in the Netherlands is whenever you make a river narrower, um, because you think it's more cost effective, in the end, it's not more cost effective because um, you cannot tell the water to stay out. And if it's coming and you need to buy up, build grounds, it's even more expensive in the end. Yes, and, and what I've learned from you um, by, by this slide, um, I think that um, we, we try to think black and white, and you, and you try to tell, to tell us that you, you can embrace it and, and you can find the in-between. You, you don't have to, you know, move the water right away. You, you can uh, embrace them and, and let them in for, for a while. In and, a and enjoy way. it. Yes. And maybe enjoy with it. Yeah. Okay. 
ก็ก็เป็นมุมมองที่ไม่ไม่เคยคาดคิดถึงมาก่อน because um, when it comes people get panic and, and want them to go away right away just And that is understandable. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and it's much easier to think about those kind of in between solutions, if your safety is in order and you can think from a safe place about the enjoyment of the water. Um, but I think with those experiences that are there now, um, you can shortcut that movement of first completely protecting, and uh, learn from the existing experiences and immediately go to the. More integrated in between solutions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have next question? Yes. What is the most costly part from climate change in the project delta? Example: maintaining, upgrading. Um, I wouldn't be sure, but I know that the big structures, like uh, the big barriers and dams, are very expensive. Um, in comparison to the earlier Delta program, actually the levee elevations were much cheaper. Um, but what we start seeing now is that because most levees are um, being built and there are so many kilometers of them, that gradually uh, starts to take up more of the budget. Um, but in general, those those new options like room for the river are more expensive um, to do. Okay. หมดแล้วใช่ไหมครับอ๋โอเค another question before the actual constructions of any flood risk projects how do you test if the design works digital simulations small scale prototyping yes how you work um, I think there are two answers to that one from the hydraulic perspective and one from the spatial perspective Uh, I'm of course an urban designer, so what we do a lot is we test by design. Um, we call that research by design, and it's getting more and more important in the field of urban and landscape design um, that you use design to already predict what will happen if the government makes a certain decision, uh, which can be on flood risk, on mobility, and you try to. Uh, draw the effect of that so that they can reflect on it and they don't have to build it uh, and then see what happens. So that is from the spatial perspective. Uh, we also developed this spatial quality assessment criteria, which on the one hand is terrible because I don't believe that you can measure spatial quality by saying, okay, one plus one is two. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so essential to give feedback to engineers about uh, the spatial quality so that politicians. Can Take that in their decision. On the hydraulic part, indeed, a lot of models are being made, uh, but also a lot of monitoring because with the models, it's just the yeah. best guess that you have, and monitoring plays a very important role. No. Yes. Okay. All right. ครับอ่าหมดคำถามจากซิฟอิมเบนแล้วด้านล่างมีท่านไหนสงสัยไหมครับมีท่านไหนอยากจะถามคำถามไหมครับสามารถายกมือได้เลยนะครับเดี๋ยวทีมงานจะส่งไมโครโฟนไปถึงท่านนะฮะมีไหมครับโอเคครับถ้าไม่มีก็ thank you very much Dr. Nelson for today open our eyes about how to design and cope with it with the flood yes and thank you so much and ขอเสียงตบมือให้ให้ด็อกเตอร์ด้วยนะครับ Thank you.